All right, so we've seen that the um, stable state of matter um, will be that state that has the lowest Gibbs energy. Um, but in fact, we can also extend that out to not just states of matter, solid liquid gas, but to multiple solid phases. Um, and that's often the case as engineers. We're dealing with um, you know, different uh, solid states of, uh, of a, a particular substance. How can we express that um, in an efficient manner? Well, there's different ways it's done. Um, and sometimes, perhaps you've seen in, in high school, uh, pressure versus temperature plots of phase stability. And, and there's a common one that we, we look at, um, which is water. And the diagram looks something like this for water. And so we've got solid over here, liquid, and gas. So high temperatures, low pressure, the gas is the, the stable phase. That makes some intuitive sense. At low temperatures over here, and high pressures, you get the solid, you're pressing all the atoms together, and at intervening temperatures and pressures, you've got the liquid state that's um, stable. And there's an interesting thing about the water system in particular, and that's that you can I, you can see it. Look, if you're if you're standing with a pair of ice skates on some solid water, and you increase the pressure, that is, in fact, the ice skate itself increases the pressure by pressing the whole weight of your body onto a little little small area. You move up. And there's this funny feature of the water phase diagram, which, which has this line here, this green line, sloping over to the left like that upon increasing pressure. And that means you go from solid to liquid. So this is, this you know, you could use to explain ice skating, for example. Because underneath your ice skate, you actually introduce some liquid phase, and that's what allows an ice skater to skate along really quickly. <clears throat> um, so that's one way of depicting it. A lot of times, though, in... Um, in material science and solid state chemistry, we, we like to look at, instead of pressure and temperature, we like to look at processes that occur uh, exposed to the atmosphere. And so pressure is fixed, and they're fixed at one atmosphere often. So we, we often express the temperature on a vertical axis like this, and then we'll look at changes in chemistry along the horizontal axis. So changes in concentration, or what we usually call composition. Composition, okay? Composition, and we could mix two things together. And what I like to do as an example is just start with pure water, and to that we'll add some sugar. So you can see we've got two things that we're mixing here. This thing on the left and the thing on the right. Uh, the formal terminology would be that there's two components, okay? Component, there's one component, and there's the other component. There's two of them, so this is called a binary system. And the composition axis, some of you'll hear me, I pronounce it incorrectly on purpose, I'll say composition. I'm reminding you that the composition axis expresses composition in weight percent of the component on the right-hand side of the phase diagram. Okay, that's the convention. It's, it's a common convention. The units of composition will be weight percent of that component. Um, and that becomes important later on when we start to talk about amounts of a phase, for example. Um, next thing we can look at, though, is let's just look at this leftmost boundary here. That is pure water. Okay, zero weight percent sugar, just pure water. Well, you know that there's a phase transformation that occurs at zero. And I'm going to limit ourselves to the liquid and solid state, so I'm not going to go above 100 to get to the gas. And you may know, in fact, that if you add a little bit of sugar to some water, you will get it to dissolve. And so you know that there's a close to, you know, hugging the leftmost boundary here, there's a liquid phase. Um, and that liquid, if you wanted a common name for it, would be syrup. Okay, that's the syrup phase. You may also know that if you add a lot of sugar, you continue to add sugar, more and more sugar into your, into your coffee, you know, and eventually, I mean, you would never do this with your coffee because it would be a huge quantity of sugar, but if you got enough sugar in there, you could hit a point where it's saturated. You hit that saturation point, or the solubility limit, it's sometimes called. Um, and you could no longer dissolve any more sugar, and you would get the sugar settling to the bottom as a, a second phase. So we know, as you get really, really close to pure sugar, we're going to have to enter into a region where there's, in fact, two phases that are at equilibrium, and two phases that are present. And that's going to be the liquid syrup and the solid um, sugar. Okay, 
So there's two phases that are present. And you may also know, in fact, that at high temperatures, you can dissolve more sugar than you can at low. So you also know that there's a phase boundary here that slopes this the way this one does here. And that phase boundary, of course, is what we had just referred to as the solubility limit. Okay? In aqueous chemistry, it might be called saturation, uh, something like that. But uh, we're going to call it the solubility limit. We also know there's a phase boundary here. There's a transition between the liquid and the solid state. So along this leftmost boundary, we can say with confidence that there's going to be solid, and that solid is going to be solid water, or we would call it ice. But what's maybe not immediately obvious is the fact that as you add some impurity, we get freezing point depression. And this is something that uh, is often covered in some high school chemistry. So this is what we're seeing here, and you've got this same result if you add salt to ice. You know, if you've got it come from a cold location, that um, ice can be applied to the road surface to prevent cars from slipping, because the ice, very much like the sugar here, depresses the freezing point, so we can maintain a liquid solution, and then people don't slip on the ice. The other thing that we can see from a phase diagram here is that there's... There's these different regions. This is a solid, a single phase region. I mean, there's a two phase region, and we're going to have some other two phase regions, and they're always bounded on the left and right by the phases that are present uh, in, in that region. So, for example, if I take a look at a high, con I've added maybe 88 percent sugar to this system, and I know that I'm above the solubility limit. I can, in fact, quantify that by saying that. I'm drawing this little horizontal line and saying, look, I've got two phases. One of them is sugar. And so the composition of that solid is, in this particular instance, actually 100 weight percent sugar. And the composition of the liquid, though, you get from the boundary of that horizontal line with the liquid phase. So the composition of the liquid is whatever that is, maybe 75 percent sugar. So similarly, we could do that anywhere over here in one of these regions and draw a line over to the left and over to the right and we'd hit a phase boundary on each side and it would give us the composition of the liquid on the rightmost side and the composition of the solid. <clears throat> so what we can take from that is that we can actually identify this region as being made of two, re two, two, uh, two phases. Solid, ice, plus liquid, syrup. Similarly down here we've got solid ice plus solid sugar. Those are the boundaries on the left and the right side. Now this is a bit of a special phase diagram because there's no solubility of water in sugar, nor is there any solubility of sugar in solid water. So the single phase region is limited to 0% sugar and the other one to 100% sugar. <clears throat> we'll explore another system, the iron carbon system, later where there is some solid solubility over here on the left hand side. But in this case there's no solid solubility. Um, so those are our regions of this phase diagram, and I like to just give you one intuitive um, look at this, and that is this region here you've probably consumed before, and this is like the Slurpee region. I guess I should put a little register there. I don't get sued by 7-Eleven or whoever makes the Slurpee, but if you've ever had one of these ice drinks or an ice cap or something from Tim Hortons, you, you, well, you know that there's a, a solid ice phase and a liquid syrup, and the syrup is delicious. If you drink it quickly... Um, you make it a brain freeze, that's a different course. But for this course, you drink it quickly, and what you know is you're left with ice. Okay, and is the ice delicious? No, the ice is not. I mean, it, well, it's, it's just pure water. Why is that? Well, because this horizontal line tells you that the composition over here, composition of that solid ice, is in fact zero. There's no sugar in it. And over here, though, the stuff that you drink is delicious because it's enriched in sugar. It's enriched in the solute. Okay, there's more sugar dissolved because it was re rejected from the ice, and so the sugar had to go in to the liquid. And so you drink this syrup, and the remaining ice sticks around as the solid phase. This is also the region where ice wine is made. Okay, if you ever know about if you if you know about ice wine, it's a sweet wine. I actually don't drink, but anyway, ice wine is produced by uh, leaving the grapes out on the on the on the vine to um, partially freeze. So you have to wait until the temperature drops down, so the grapes partially freeze, and then you harvest them, 
uh, and you actually squish them, you, I don't know, you press them, I guess is the term, so that the juice comes out while they're still partially frozen. And so you get this syrup coming out that's sweeter than you would normally get from a grape because you've formed some ice crystals and the sugar has been rejected from the ice. The ice has maintained it with the solid, with the skins and stuff, but the syrup comes out with the dissolved sugar. All right, so this stuff's all around you. We can use this same technique, the same concept to refine silicon for semiconductor devices where we pass a molten zone through a material and, and, and the impurities are rejected into the liquid. In fact, even Krasowski um, single crystal growth of, of silicon is, it relies on a similar concept where we grow this crystal from a, a molten vat of silicon and the impurities become concentrated in the, uh, in the remaining liquid phase. Anyway, good stuff. Let's stop it there and we'll look at some more phase equilibria in a separate video. Thanks a lot.